Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell everyone what's happening in today's episode? In today's episode, we are going to talk about how hard it is to research women in history. And I'm going to introduce you to a woman named Mrs. Eaton. Okay. And we are going to talk about the Trail of Tears. Ooh, interesting. Let's get into this. Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, the other 50% the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. Episode 20, Mrs. So-and-so, Mrs. Eaton, <laughs> and the Trail of Tears. Mrs. So-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> it just makes me think of, like, an old British, like, you old so-and-so. You so-and-so. <laughs> okay. So, Mrs. So-and-so is getting us to talking about why it is really hard to get women into history class. Taking a human being and reducing her to Mrs. Somebody rather wow. than who she is. And okay. so I think that, like, ties kind of into the issue here. Um, Wait, I have to stop you and okay. tell our audience, Kelsey's, where we record is cold. <laughs> the heat doesn't rise as well. She has a sleeping bag on right now. I've taken a photo to post on our Instagram <laughs> because she's currently recording in a lime green sleeping bag. Listen, I may or may not be a caterpillar, but it's cool. Sorry. I currently have a old lady grandma sweater on and Kelsey's, um, I don't want to say ugly blanket. It's cozy. We'll call it country. Country chic. Chic. <laughs> but I mean, this is this is how the, the money gets made here, this is, people. These are the money makers: sleeping bags and and shabby blankets. <laughs> Anyways, okay. Let's get sorry back to the story, not about our cold feet. Mrs. So and so. Okay, so women more than men have names that change over the course of their lifetime. You have your birth name. Some would call them maiden names, but Gloria Steinem has informed me that maidenhood has nothing to do with it. <laughs> and um, so birth names, and then many women go on to have married names. Yep. And if you chain, if you get married and divorced or widowed, another married name, right? And so your names change multiple times over the course of your life. So if you're a historian and you are trying to mm. track a woman through time using documents, that's really hard to do because you might have a birth certificate that says one thing and a marriage certificate that says something else. And it well, may and if she got married multiple times, Ugh. forget it. Forget it. It's crazy. Um, it's also very, like, old school custom, customary to refer to somebody by the name of their husband. My grandmother still writes me letters. Dear Mrs. Jeffrey Eckert. Ooh. Yeah, that's me. Mrs. Jeffrey Eckert. That really makes you think that you should pick a husband with a great name. Yeah, that would be a good one, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, that actually matters. <laughs> this, this is my husband, Gaylord, New Hampshire. I don't know. Like some ridiculous. New Hampshire? Is that? What are you going on? Like Washington mom? <laughs> yeah. Let's. <laughs> George Foreman. <laughs> this is also George Foreman. Um, so this last bit about like Mrs. Somebody, it, it makes it really, it makes it really difficult to, to research people because like the woman I'm about to tell you about, Mrs. Eaton, um, I was doing research. I was looking for her name in newspapers on the Library of Congress's Chronicling America database, which teachers, you should totally be using with your students. <laughs> okay. They have um, Chronicling America, so it's chroni like Library of Congress Chronicling America. If you Google that, um, they have newspapers from all throughout U.S. history, from all over the country. And cool. so any topic that you want to research, if it was like pre, I think it's like pre-1960, I'm making that up, but um, they have digitized all of these newspapers. And so you can search key terms and their database can find those key terms in all these old, like, newspapers. Yeah. It's really cool. So I was searching for, um, her name is Peggy Eaton. But okay. Peggy is a nickname. Yeah, for usually so Margaret, right? Margaret. So she's Margaret Eaton. So I'm searching Margaret Eaton. But Margaret Eaton isn't going to come up because she's not Margaret Eaton. She's 
Mrs. Some Man Eaton, or maybe she's <laughs> Mrs. Eaton, or maybe she, right? Like, ah, I need yeah. to find this lady. And then how many Eatons are there? Oh, gosh, right? yeah. When That's a reduced... very popular British name. Ugh. So, how annoying. Yeah, for sure. And you could go down some really dark rabbit holes for a long time to come up short. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're like, maybe she goes like, by Maggie. Maybe I'll follow Maggie Eaton for a while. It's like, right. nope, nope. Well, and then God forbid the person like Mrs. Eaton, who we're about to talk about, is actually married three times in the oh, course of her no. life. So, <laughs> Did I foreshadow annoyance? <laughs> so she has her birth name. She has her first husband's name. She has her second husband's name and her third husband's name. So over the course of her life, she goes by four different names. Man. Um, another... Thank I, God she didn't have the internet back then, because I'll tell you what, changing your name now blows. <laughs> yeah. It's the worst. Did you have a hard time changing your name? Uh, yeah, it was pretty frustrating. And before I got married, I started making a list of things that had my I, my birth name, we'll say. Birth name. Yes. Yeah. Um, on it so that I could remember that I need to change. I still have a credit card <laughs> with my birth name on it because I was like, like, whatever, I'm over this. I'm over it. <laughs> it's way too when when it, the date expires, I'll get a new one and they'll send me the new one with my new name. But yeah, so annoying. So. I was in grad school when we got married, <gasps> and I had to take... So all of your stuff for your university is in your birth name. Everything. And I had to take the Praxis exam. Oh, gosh. And my husband and I also are stupid, and so we decided to, like, instead of me just adopting Eckert as my last name, we decided to be, like, more, you know, egalitarian or whatever, and so we both took my father's name as our middle names okay so kelsey brooke ecker so and then jeff is jeff brooke ecker oh. and so we both we both changed our entire names but because it wasn't simple we had to go in front of a judge and be like yes we are the same people and we would like to change our names you know blah 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 it was like way more complicated than just adding Eckert to the end yeah in retrospect don't be a feminist and just, like, take the man's name and move on. It's way easier. <laughs> or don't, and then that's even easier. Oh, like, my gosh. Or, yeah, just don't. My sister didn't change her name at all. and My sister-in-law didn't do either. That. Like, and it, I don't blame her for it. It makes sense to me. Yeah. But it, it's also, it's a total choice. Yeah. Um, But people do get a little weird about it when you, if you don't change your name. Yeah. I do think that there's still a cultural, like, abnormality if you don't yeah which is a little odd my friend um one of my best friends growing up her and her wife because they are a lesbian couple and they're getting married they made up their own last name nice which is a beautiful last name and it's and it means something to them they chose something of meaning and so i'm like kind of jealous that they got to to like combine our names i thought that would be way cooler what were some of the options brecker that's cool we know a brecker Okay, I'm in. Molly. Oh, but she's Becker. Uh, yeah, I know, but we're just going to add an R. You know? <laughs> it's cool. Brecker. Anyway, all right. We're digressing. I'm just thinking about if I hyphenated mine or combined my last name with my birth name. Sanger. I like it. Or Tullivan. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> this could, this, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, Move on with the topic. <laughs> if there's anyone out there that wants to give more options, we're always open. So this has been a problem in my career, though, trying to, like, track women through time. And also, it just makes the writing of history really, really tedious. When I was in grad school, I wrote a history paper on um, Mary Baker Eddy, who yeah. is the founder of Christian Science, and she's from New Hampshire, um, she was born in Bow, and um, she was actually the first New Hampshire woman inducted into the Women's Hall of Fame, okay. which is kind of cool. Um, and she, um, so I was tracing her through time, and she, so she was born Mary Baker. Then she married a man named Glover. She moved to the South. They moved back. She married a man named Patterson. Patterson was a spy for the Confederacy during the Civil War. All right. And um, she, he abandoned her, so she, like, got divorced through that. And then, um, and then she finally married a man named Eddie. But writing a paper in history, traditionally, when you're writing about somebody, you introduce them first. You say, like, 
this is George Washington. And then for the rest of the paper, you refer to him as Washington. So what do you do oh, with true. Mary yeah. Baker Eddy? Like, do you spend the first part of your paper talking about her as Mary Baker? And then you talk about her as Mary Glover? And then you refer to her as Patterson? you just call her Mary Patterson. the whole time? Well, and, and it gets confusing when you've got, like, John Adams and Abigail Adams. And, like, so who gets to be called Adams? True. Right? I don't know. Maybe that's just, like, semantics or something. But I no, think it's really but annoying. No, I... I, I We'll wager a guess that there's an English major out there that is like, no, 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 no. This yeah. is how you write it. And so, uncon- like, this is probably unconventional, but I didn't, I could not, like, she changes her name so much in her life that I was like, okay, whatever. Her name's Mary, and that's what I'm going to refer yeah. to her as throughout this paper, because that's the only <laughs> thing that didn't change. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah, no kidding. So, we'll talk about her in a different episode, because um, she's obviously pretty significant in New Hampshire history. Um, cool. And also, okay. in, in world... Uh, U.S. history. Um, So the person that I want to introduce you to today is Margaret O'Neill. Oh, cool. She, that was her birth name. I am related to the O'Neills. Are you? So that's kind of fun. Okay. Um, She was 17 when she married a man named John Timberlake, who was 39. Was this Justin Timberlake's grandfather? I (laughs) wish it was. You know what? Let's can someone find out? Yeah, we need a we need a family. If tree. the man can dance, <laughs> also is a golfer, donates buses to children in need. He does that. Oh yeah, Justin Timberlake was just in the news for donating um, a wheelchair accessible van to a person that needed it. He's so awesome I and know. beautiful. Okay, well yeah. we digress. Anywho, um, but thirty nine. He's 39, she's 17. This would be like your husband marrying. Current a JTT? <laughs> yeah, so it'd be like current JTT <laughs> marrying a high schooler. <laughs> Ew. So gross. Okay. I mean, <clears throat> if you looked like the current Justin Timberlake. Yeah, maybe. I'm possible, sorry. I've gone way far off. Also this. rape, you know? like. Um, yeah, good call. Good call. Okay. All right, moving on. Not yeah. funny. Not, Not funny. funny. Doesn't matter if you look like Justin Timberlake. Still so rape. rape. Still rape. Still <laughs> rape. Turns out, just because you're sexy, still rape. Still rape. Um, so he was a purser in the Navy. I learned. I'm what sorry. A, yeah. Yeah. I learned what a purser was. Do they wait? Can I guess? Please. Did they collect the purses of all of the men on the ship before they the left? Purses. Yeah, he manages the money. Yeah. Oh, nice. Woohoo! I'm very proud of myself. Yeah. So, um. So men had purses. <laughs> All I'm thinking about is, like, Joey from Friends with his man bag. Yes. His purse. <laughs> his purse. His purse. Yes. His purse. <laughs> so, in 1818, this couple meets a man named John Eaton. Okay. Okay. John Eaton was 28. A little bit younger. Closer in age to Mrs. Timberlake at the time. Okay. Um, but not her husband. And I hope I am foreshadowing that this person, this couple befriended, goes on to marry his wife. Oh, total. Total. I did not see that coming. I know. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so, we're going to zoom away from Yeah, why are we Timberlake talking about these people? Eden drama, and we're going to back up okay. and talk about what the heck's going on in the world around 1818. Okay. 1818. 1818. So, this is the time when a man named Andrew Jackson is becoming pretty prominent in American politics. If you don't know Andrew Jackson, pick up your $20 bill and look at his face. Who carries money anymore? I don't know. Okay, people. <laughs> they, he, he's not in Venmo. You can't put him through PayPal. But you could Google what a $20 <laughs> bill looks like and look at it. All right. He's on the $20 bill, apparently. He's on the $20 bill. Okay. Is he the guy with the really large no. forehead? Like the five so head? He, yes. Okay. He is the guy that they are trying to replace with Harriet Tubman for reasons which we are going to get into in the second half of this episode. Okay. Okay. So who is Andrew Jackson? He is a veteran and a general and a hero from the War of 1812. And I would say hero is a weird word, but, like, he won a big battle, the Battle of New Orleans. Okay. um, Which, this is really interesting. The war had ended. They signed the Treaty of Ghent, but 
it's 1812 and the or maybe it's 1813 at this point it hasn't the news that the surrender and treaty has been signed hasn't gotten to new orleans yet oh so he has to fight this battle of new orleans which he wins um and but it's kind of weird that it happens after the treaty is signed but anyway we digress so he um he really I'm going to I'm going to save everything related to Native Americans and him for the second There's half of this. So much foreshadowing. I know. Okay. I know. So many things. Okay. So <laughs> I feel like anyone listening has to write these things down. Okay, so we've Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson. We've got what's her name? Timberlake. <laughs> Margaret, Margaret Peggy, Peggy Timberlake. Timberlake. Who's friends with this man John Eaton? Okay. Friends. All right. We've okay. got we've got the players. We've got people. Okay. So Jackson is a general, and he is well known because of the War of 1812 and also because of a whole bunch of wars with Native Americans, which we are going to get into in the second half of okay. this episode. Um, and in 1824, he runs for president against John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams is the son of, first son of John and Abigail Adams. Yes. Kind of like a monarchy in an, in an American aristocracy. Yes. We, I also dressed up like him in our fourth grade class. No, you did not. John Quincy Adams, right here. That's you. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, everyone had to have, be a president. My best friend got Bill Clinton, but of course I got John Quincy Adams. Did you wear the high socks? Oh, of course I did. Okay. And he had, he had the Benjamin Franklin glasses. Oh, well, there you have it. And he loved vests. So John Quincy... <laughs> Um, runs, so runs against Andrew Jackson. It's kind of a contentious election. It's really close, but there are four people that are running for president that year. That's a lot. so nobody wins. They get... And at this time, were there parties? Yeah, but the parties, if you look at a chart of American political parties, it's sort of like you've got your Federalists and your Anti-Federalists, and you get to the 1820s, and it's just like, political parties, (laughs) and then like it's like Whigs, and then they peter out, and then it's like Republicans and Democrats. Yep, okay. So, um... So, Andrew Jackson is again, running against John Quincy, and there are four people, though, that, are, that run, and because nobody gets a majority, what happens um, in the Constitution at the time is that goes to the House of Representatives, and the House of Representatives gets to decide. But Andrew Jackson had won way more electoral votes than John Quincy had. Okay. And um, so he, sh- you know, like in theory, he should have won. But Henry Clay, who was in fourth place of the four, he did, got the fewest votes, he um, and John Quincy Adams make a deal, which is that if John Quincy Adams makes him Secretary of State, he will get everybody who voted for him to vote to vote for John Quincy Adams. So Jackson calls this the corrupt bargain, and John Quincy <laughs> wins the presidency, and he's president for four years. For those four years, Andrew Jackson is plotting the next election. Oh, I and I thought you were going to go darker than that. No, not darker. He, <laughs> I mean, he does, uh, like, the accounts that I've read say that he was, like, semi-gentlemanly about the loss, um, but definitely thought it was wrong and corrupt that okay. he lost. Um, so... I feel like back then they'd be like, Humph, I am oh. so disappointed in myself, and then, oh. like, and then write a yeah. snarly letter that will take six months to deliver to the other person. <laughs> <laughs> So Jackson is, um, so, and and this is really interesting because Adams and and Jackson could not be more different. Okay. Jackson's from west of the Appalachians. He's the first person to run, like, to, to become president from, like, the west at the time. Whereas John Quincy Adams, like I said, is, like, American political aristocracy. Right. And, um, and, you know, you've got a New Englander with sort of, like, these business, mercantilism sort of Yeah, and he's, like, a lawyer and... Yeah, versus, like, Jackson, who's a general. He's known for slaughtering Native Americans and, like... Just these guys could not be more different. So in 1828, they face off again, but now it's just the two of them. Okay. Oh, by the way, I just want to give you a little piece of New Hampshire weirdness that I think is really interesting. Um, John, or sorry, Henry Clay, who does this whole corrupt bargain thing, he never becomes president of the United States. In New Hampshire, we have a mountain range called the Presidentials. Yeah. Mount Clay is one of them. Oh, that's funny. I don't get it. Probably when they 
Mm, I have no idea. I don't know. When they named them. <laughs> you know, when they were going around naming shit back then. <laughs> Clay was like, I'll take a mountain. I'll take a mountain, please. Thank you. <laughs> like, well, like any other <laughs> douchey white dude back then. It's like, what else can I put my name on? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so 1828, it gets really, really ugly because it's these two guys like going, I mean, they've already campaigned against each other. There's the corrupt bargain. Yeah, background. this is the, the rematch this of all rematches. Rematch. Um, Welcome to the down battle. in history as the nastiest um, election in American history. Oh, 2020 and 2016 included. <laughs> I was going to say, the word nasty came out a lot in 2016. <laughs> yeah, nasty women. Um, so here's an example. Um, this is a quote from a person um, who was talking, uh, pro-Adams person talking about Jackson. Okay. They said, General Jackson's mother was a common prostitute brought to this country by British soldiers. She afterward married a mulatto man with whom she had uh, several children, one of which was Andrew Jackson. So racism is in there. Oh, yeah. Sexism is in there. Like, these people are going hard at Andrew Jackson. Well, like, and that's my mom. <laughs> but also to throw in that you are biracial back then. Oh, yeah. Huge oh. insult. Yeah. Like, which is so messed up. But, like... It's, it's awful and obviously not. But back then, that would... that Those are fighting words. Like, yeah. that's big time. That's I mean, it's, it's similar to, you know, you could probably put it against, like, Trump going after Obama and where his birth certificate is yeah. from. It's like, totally. you're not a U.S. citizen. It's like, oh, it's like, my God. Oh, my God. Why? Because I, is there something wrong with my face? Oh, yeah. Is it, is it my skin color? Is that what it is? <laughs> oh. um, so, so, that's just an example of how nasty this election gets. Jackson's wife, Rachel, dies during the campaign <gasps> season Aww. of a heart attack. And... For him, he, for, I mean, she, if his mom's getting those sorts of things thrown at her. Oh, I can imagine. She is just getting attacked. Do like they have crazy. any children at this point, too? Um, I don't know about children, but here's what I do know. So she was um, married in the 1790s to somebody else. Oh. And, you know, women don't handle a lot of the finances or legal things. And so she and her spouse at the time got divorced, or so she thought. And Me. she married Jackson. And it was kind of this, like, little scandal because she wasn't actually divorced and she was married to another man. That is sort of, like, she is accused of all sorts of things, like yeah. being an adulteress, being whatever, and then she she dies. And so he never forgives Adams because he basically blames him and all this, like, stuff for the drama. causing her heart attack. Oh, gosh. And so kind of a crazy, crazy re-election. And I think what's really interesting is just that, like, women were forefront in the dialogues. And one of the things they talk about is, like, policy was not really talked about. Like, a lot of people, when Jackson eventually became president after that election, people were like, oh, yeah, like, I wonder what he's actually going to do. Because we never <laughs> talked about, like, <laughs> policy. Oh, he has a job to do when he, he gets here? Oh. What, what he's not just a celebrity great right. and we can't just like insult the women in his life mm. fascinating tough times so bringing it back to the Eatons. all right so okay. we're back so we're putting the jacksons down and the adams down yep and, and we're, we're bringing picking... it back to okay. margaret o'neill and john timberlake who have been married still thinking justin Timberlake. i know it's john <laughs> okay john timberlake dies and before the mourning period was over what's a mourning period like the, six weeks <laughs> it's two months where you wear oh. black and you mourn the loss of your spouse before the mourning period is over she is married to john eaton oh, scandal. scandal okay so she so so he died maybe she's just tired of wearing black it's a, it's not a fun color that. back then yeah I mean, it's my number one, always, but... Well, you're a different human. <laughs> um, he dies in suspicious circumstances. Oh. Or so they say. Some There were rumors, and these were, I think, just rumors, that he committed suicide because he found out about her affair with John Eaton. Oh. Um, who knows? Um, but they did do an autopsy, and it looks like he probably died of pneumonia, and it probably was just an accident. Um, Poor. Not an accident, but, like, nature. Poor Timberlake. Poor Timberlake. So he dies, and she marries 
John Eaton. All right. Okay. So now we got Peggy Eaton. We've got Peggy Eaton, Margaret Peggy Eaton. Okay. She's been Timberlake. Now she's in Eaton. Okay. And um, she, so John is appointed to be Secretary of War in Andrew Jackson's cabinet. John Timberlake. John, John Eaton. Eaton. Okay. I know both her husbands are John. Like, girl, branch out, you know? <laughs> I imagine in that time period it was either John, John Mary, Mary <laughs> Edward. Yeah. I think that's for Adam. George. George. Yeah. Ra- Rachel. Rebecca. Rachel. Yeah. <laughs> Biblical people. Biblical. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so, she, so, John is in the cabinet and they are married but she is not liked or accepted by any of the other women that are in the cabinet. So does not get invited to the sewing circle. No one teaches her how to make rye bread. Right. <laughs> but they, but these are these are these are American elite. So they're not sewing circle. They're not oh. breading. No, they're they going, going to like to balls. Parties, yeah. And they are they are <clears throat> society folk. And she is not being included or invited to anything. Just because of the the circumstances of, with her husband's death? Because of the circumstances. People think that she is all sorts of bad names. Oh, um, how one salacious. One historian explained that the real reason Washington society did not like her is that she did not know her place. She forthrightly spoke up about anything that came to her mind, even topics which women were supposed to be ignorant. She thrust herself into the world in a manner inappropriate for a woman. Except her and society was in danger of disruption. Except this uncouth, impure, forward, worldly woman and the wall of virtue and morality would be breached and society would have no further defense against the forces of frightening change. Margaret Eaton was not that important in herself. It was what she represented that constituted the threat. Proper women had no choice. They had to prevent her acceptance into society as part of their defense of that society's morality. I mean, damn. Ouch. (laughs) But also, can this be my obituary? (laughs) Can you just take her name out and put Brooke Sullivan? Brooke Sullivan. Not accepted into society. <laughs> no. Her um, morality will breach society. <laughs> please. I hope everyone says that about me when I'm gone. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Her morality was what killed her. What killed her? <laughs> killed us all. So, but seriously, um, so she is that's not. That's aggressive. She's not welcomed at all. And one of the people that is sort of the person behind this. Who's is the mean girl? Who's the leader? Floride. I think that's how you say it. Calhoun and her husband is the vice president okay yes okay and so she does not want this want Mrs. Eaton in at all and it becomes such a problem that Jackson literally has a cabinet meeting where he's like dude you guys have to invite Mrs. Eaton to stop this is in a cabinet meeting in the White House where he's like can we all just be nice to Peggy and Jackson, given the background that I just told you, <laughs> is like petition, in a position where he would sympathize with Peggy Eaton, given what his wife went through in right. the election okay. of 1828. Well, and because he doesn't have any policies to work on, so might as well get into the social <laughs> well, circumstance. And there's like so many different things that are going on in the 1820s that are about like shifting gender roles. You've got, you know, different spheres of influence being really okay. heavily established. Um, but you've also got like Bostonian elite, right? The 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 New York elite. The New York elite, where <clears throat> these roles are pretty firm, and then Jackson is a, is a frontiersman, right? And so he represents a totally different like world, view yeah, and, and world for for gender relations. And so it's like it's. But he also comes from a world which we've talked about in the past, where women were relatively equal because of the labor yep. that was required to open a home front yep. out west. Yeah. You know, you had to run cattle. You had to be able to do all the things that a man could do to survive. Yeah. Well, and not to, like, bring... I don't want to 
this is like a very funny kind of historical event, but <laughs> we are about to talk about the Trail of Tears, which he participates in, and the way that he treats Native American women there is no different than the way he treats the men, and, you know, slaughters them left and right, and Ugh. so I think, like, um, I think that definitely adds to what you're saying as yeah. well. So, oh my gosh. Yeah, okay, so, we'll so, get there. so Peggy, can, can she get invited to the party? <laughs> right. So I do want to read um, one of the letters that was sent to, um, sent about her. Okay. Um, so. Oh, man. See. This is like 1800s gossip rags. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. This would be like the People magazine of that time. Right. So this is a letter um, from a Mrs. Smith uh, to a Mrs. Kirkpatrick. What do okay. we got here? So she says, tonight General Eaton, the bosom friend and almost adopted son of General Jackson, is to be married to a lady whose reputation, her previous connection with him, both before and after her husband's death, was totally destroyed. Her Ooh. reputation totally destroyed. She is the daughter of O'Neill, who kept a large tavern and boarding house with whom Littleton knew. Somebody knew somebody, right? Okay. And at the time of boarding house where you got strange people in now all the in, time in yeah out. it's not a very reputable so basically she's an adulteress from go. like poor eaton doesn't even be- peggy doesn't even have a chance mm. and so she goes on and talks about that she talks about how um there's all this like personal friendships getting in the way of like the the cabinet appointments and all these sorts Jeez. of things so this whole thing, it goes down, I, I would refer to it as the Peggy Eaton affair. But some people in the time referred to it as the petticoat affair to be, like, oh. very belittling of it. And, um... Petticoats for the audience. Those are the underskirts of dresses. Is that yes. right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, um... Jackson has to basically start dismissing people from his cabinet because this becomes so disruptive. So what's really interesting about this, and I thought, like, I don't know whose side I'm on because on the one side I'm like, well, Peggy, like, here is a confident, like, outspoken, does whatever the heck she wants woman who is being ostracized by a bunch of mean girls. But then on the other hand, like, Marriage and the defense of marriage and, uh, like, marriage is women's, like, ticket to security. And here's a woman who maybe has, like, fractured the stability of marriage. Okay. All right. And, you know, a woman's reputation is a really important part of, like, distinguishing herself. That's really the only way that she can distinguish herself. Well, and it's your equity in the time of how you you get anywhere. Yeah. And certainly how your husband's going to get anywhere. I mean, if he has aspirations to be in politics, relationships are everything. Yeah. And so he needs to be invited to the dinners and go to the balls and shake the hands and do the things because that's his career. Yeah. So if she can't get all in. Yeah. Then, I mean, he basically strapped himself to a bomb. So Jackson ends up dismissing pretty much everyone except for Van Buren, who goes on to be his vice president in the okay. next in the next election and becomes president after him. So he dismisses and everybody because of this drama. He literally dismisses the entire cabinet. And what's crazy is we talk about in history power you know Mm -hmm. like like we started with talking about presidents like jackson and adams and their whole thing but women in all of history have held passive power and have passively been able to do a hell of a lot of stuff yeah and here's an example where a bunch of mean girls took down the cabinet of the (laughs) united states i mean (laughs) that's pretty awesome also, though, that Jackson was like, I'm just not having it. Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye. So he ends up having, like, three different cabinets over the course of his first term. A lot of people make parallel. So Jackson um, is the first Democrat in American history. So okay. he founds the Democratic Party. The And actually, this is kind of an interesting anecdote. The donkey, which is the emblem. Yeah. So jackass. They called him a jackass. And so Jackson the jackass. So that's where the dunk. How does this man get on the $20 bill? Oh, well, he's very popular. And that is one of the things that 
um, I have my students debate is was so he runs on this campaign of I am a man for the common people. I'm not John Quincy. Right? I'm not. Yeah, I'm not an heiress. I have my students debate whether or not that's true um, because there's a whole bunch of things that he does as president um, that don't really play well. That to don't that. really play well to that. One of the most famous political cartoons of him is him dressed as a king because um, he uses his veto power um, really heavily during his oh. presidency. Um, but he's incredibly, incredibly popular. And so when it comes to talking about things like the Trail of Tears, what's really hard is, was Jackson a man for the common people? Not if you're a Native American. Yeah. Not at all. Not if you're an enslaved person. Not at all. And so common people being rural white folk. Yeah. Yeah he's your man and he's voted in 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 big numbers by those people Um, well they're the only ones voting right (laughs) it's not like native americans get the right to vote poor white people actually in the 1820s are voting for the first time poor poor white men are voting for the first time in the 1820s okay you used uh, prior to that you used to have to own land and so in 1828 we actually have huge voter turnout and so there's so many parallels between jackson and trump even though they represent two different different political parties most historians are are yeah but isn't it and maybe i'm wrong here but is hasn't the democratic party kind of flipped oh totally and it it now it more or less represents a completely different party than what it came out to start as if you look at if you look it was like the more conservative party it used to be like the more there's a lot of different things that have shifted um over time for sure yeah. in the party and it, issue to issue it could vary but yeah they have flipped in terms of geography like where they yeah they gain followers and things like that and that was definitely true in the 1820s as well um but yeah so he so he's a really interesting president and i have my students um debate whether he actually was a president for the common man and his defense of peggy eaton i think is is also an interesting yeah. piece of that question um and and so I include um, documents about the Peggy Eaton affair um, for them to look at, as well as the Trail of Tears, okay. um, because that is obviously um, a huge part of, of his legacy. So, um, let's take a short break. Oh, okay, fine. And we'll be right back. <laughs> For lesson plan ideas and how to teach women's history, visit our website, www.remedialherstory.com. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Remedial Herstory. If you think what we're doing is needed, please consider joining our Patreon community. Patreon allows you to sponsor a podcast with a small donation. Patrons get access to bonus materials, extended episodes, insider information, and gear. Give at whatever level you can. Patrons who give at the $25 tier will receive a Remedial Herstory mug and a booklet of all the Remedial Herstory lesson plans and resources. This episode is sponsored by our patrons. Thank you to Kent and Jamie Heckel from Ohio, Sarah Reardon from New Hampshire, Leah Tanger from Connecticut, and Bridget Erlinson from Connecticut. You guys make this show possible. Well, hello there. Do you wish your high school history course had more drinking, more swearing, and more ladies? Well, do we have the show for you. Her Story on the Rocks is a long-form podcast talking about good women, bad women, fictional women, and non-fictional women from all times and places. Basically, each week we pair two women who we research with a themed signature cocktail. You won't be sorry you listened to our latest episode. Available everywhere you listen to podcasts. Cheers. Cheers. All right, Brooke, welcome back. Yes. Yes. All right. Let's get into this. Okay. So, um, 
this next part of the episode is not as funny. Um, well, not that a woman's entire reputation being destroyed was funny, but... Um, <laughs> I usually am able to make humor out of most things. What do we got? You can't on this one. So, okay. <laughs> uh, this, so we're going to talk about the Trail of Tears, which um, today is probably the biggest thing that Andrew Jackson is most known for. Okay. And um, I... A lot of the primary sources related to the Trail of Tears are Jackson himself, other general, other U.S. generals, okay, um, and then chiefs from various Indian. So tribes. lots of guys, lots of guys, basically, and um, the I you know a lot of the things that I t- teach with in when I teach about this in class are male voices, mm-hmm. and um, I was struck the other day when I was teaching my students <coughs> about this that. Helen Hunt Jackson. I don't think there's a relation. Um, <laughs> Why are there so many celebrities in tonight's episode? <laughs> um, she wrote in 1889 a book called A Century of Dishonor. And it's about all of the different Native American wars. And so she, um, in, in 1889, she's still a primary source for Indian wars because they're going on. Um, Wounded Knee doesn't happen until the 1890s. Okay. And that's sort of like the end of Indian wars, per se, but not the end of Indian resistance. Okay. Um, And so she's, you know, this woman is still a primary source, even though she wouldn't be a primary source to the Trail of Tears. Like, she did a whole bunch of research Mm -hmm. about this when she wrote in 1889. And I thought, oh, wow, that's interesting. Like, here's a woman historian slash primary source who is, like, wrote about all of this. Um. But not it's, for, it's not a first person account. Not not of wounded, or not of um, the Trail of Tears. Okay. And so I said, well, this is one of those stupid ones. Like, why am I using these sources that are all male? Like, there yeah. have to be women who know about this or wrote about this. And I stumbled upon an oral history um, okay. that I, I want to share some some bits from. Um, but then I also uh, recently read An Indigenous People's History of the United States, which came out um, recently, um, by Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz. And, okay. um, and so here's another woman historian and, and a Native American herself writing about you know Native American yeah. history. Um, which is, which is really cool. So, um, I want to start by talking about Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, um, and her book, Indigenous People of, uh, of the United States. And, um, she does not hold back. Good. And I... Give it to us. It was really great to hear because, um, I think that... The p- people need to understand the parallels between what Jackson does and what Genghis Khan did. Oh my gosh! And yeah. what Hitler does, and um, she uses the language that the Nazis used to explain their approach to dealing with the Jews. Um, she used language like um, "final solution." Oh jeez. Okay, um, and so. I, I, I really appreciated that. She also gave me, as a history teacher, and this is a good one for, you know, I'm not an indigenous person. Um, and so the, you know, as, as somebody who did not grow up in that culture, um, she, you know, helped me have language that I should be using in class. And I have always used... Um, Indian, indigenous, and native kind of interchangeably. Right. And she said that that's great. And I was like, oh, cool. Like, that's so nice to, to make sure that I'm doing that, uh, like, kindly and yeah. and whatever. Um, and then, obviously, she said, but if you do know the name of the tribe, use, use that. it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Makes sense. Um, um, I have, I've also heard um, First Nation. Yes, she talks about First Nation uh, in one of the early chapters of her book, which um, is that like a newer really, movement? She, she, yeah, so it's a kind of a newer movement, but she's actually not very impressed with some of the newer movement things because it's trying to what she says like paint U.S. history as like we're a melting pot of all oh, sorts okay. of different yeah. people, and it sort of ignores what she sees as genocide. Right, and um, so like they were first and they were here but 
that's not how they were treated, you know? And so, like, yeah. so why are, why are we changing the, what, you know, like, let's not revise that history. Um, Makes sense. Yeah, which I thought was really interesting because I have also heard of that as sort of, like... Especially local to here in New England because there are... Vermont has several still vibrant tribes. Yeah. Um, and so working at Dartmouth College, they have weeks that they do because it... Dartmouth College originated as an educational institution for Native Americans mm. by the British. And so that's how the history of Dartmouth College started. No way. Yeah, it's really, really cool to look into and working there. Everyone kind of gets the history. Um, but it has... To acculturate Native Americans. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which is really interesting. But now they kind of, they honor Native American history and... Actually, they have the largest number of Native American students attending an Ivy League school. That's awesome. And they hold space for students of Native American culture. Cool. That's which awesome. is really cool. So, um, but you get to be around it. They do this huge week-long powwow, and it's fascinating to see the local tribes there. But a lot of them do recognize themselves, and they say First Nation. Yeah. Oh, um, oh, interesting. So I don't know if that's like a New England thing. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Um, so I, I really appreciated reading her book and, um, and so if you're not like, you're not really sure why I'm, I'm using charged language like genocide to describe this, then let's get into it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so she talks a lot in, in her book about how Jackson really begins his career by killing, being the Indian killer. And that's like how he grows his career. In 1814, he, um, demands absolute um, surrender from the Muscogee um, Native Americans who were rebelling near Tennessee. And one thing that always strikes me is just the statistics. I mean, the statistics are semi-known because they're taken by the U.S. Army. They're in this war that happened, or in this battle that happens at Horseshoe Bend. You can look up the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. There are 800 Native Americans that die. Whoa. And 49 from the American military. That's, like, why? Like, why? <laughs> At some point, like, they've been beaten. Stop. Wow. Just stop. Um, after this battle, he uses skin from Native Americans that were killed to create horse reins and decorative things that people would wear. What? Or use. Ugh. And these things were given to, like, elite ladies of Tennessee Ugh. as gifts. That's, like, what's the house, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where the guy would eat the faces? Yeah. And this is somebody who's about to become president of the United States. Oh, gross. That just, like, makes my stomach turn. He's on turn. the $20 bill. Yeah. <laughs> This is also where, like, when we hold up heroes from the past without talking about... What they did. Like this. Yeah. It's infuriating. It's, and then you're like, yeah, to, take the statues down. Take them off the $20 bill. Yeah. When you... I mean, it's over and over again. General Shivington out in Colorado, he, like, he is applauded as a war hero. And when you learn about what he did, it's the Sand Creek Massacre. It's like, like, he, like, ripped people's private parts out like oh, it's like gross. what are you Ugh. this is disgusting and these are american quote unquote heroes so do you as a high school teacher like you're not going to gloss over this you can't because if you do you're lying yeah you are li like like but, if, if if hitler did it would you tell your students yeah so if jackson does it should you tell your students yeah it makes sense i'm just it curious of like are you telling them about the body parts and the things and like really giving them the details that are going to stick with them? My students are in 11th and 12th grade. Yeah, so they'll be they able to handle it. They should be able to handle it. Yeah, that's probably when I started watching but, horror movies. But if I were um, teaching younger grades, yeah, I would not shot. I maybe would not give details as to not give a child nightmares, but I would yeah. use words like atrocities. Yeah, genocide. Like, use the, the words that describe what they did that moment without in time. being specific. Yep. And um, so I think, y yes, you can soften that for younger kids, but not soften the meaning. 
Right. You don't want to gloss over what actually happened, but I'm just thinking, like, how granular do you need to get? Right. So, in response to the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, he won a commission oh, from yeah. the president at he the time. He got paid. He got paid to kill some people. Yep. Yeah. And so, um, one of the other things that I didn't, like, I knew this, but I didn't really think about the interconnectedness of these two things. Okay. Is that every time Americans, and I should say United States of Americans, um, take more Native American territory... They are also simultaneously expanding slavery into that territory. So the history of Native American expulsion and mm-hmm. and massacres really coincides with the history of American slavery. Because the more land that we have, the more land that can be planted and, okay. and, and processed. And more workers are more needed. More workers are needed. Um, so he moves on and he battles with the Seminoles down in Florida. Um, Monroe orders him there to, um, because I guess there's a whole bunch of marooned, um, and hiding out slaves who have, who have enslaved people who have fled the United States and are hiding out in Spanish occupied Florida. And so he goes down in there to not only defeat the Seminole, but also to get the enslaved people back. Jeez. And, um, Wait. one of the... I guess I didn't know Spain occupied Florida. Yeah, so after so when when Columbus lands, he lands in the Caribbean. Okay. Um and yeah, he takes over parts of Florida and then obviously they go into like the Mexico area and then down into South America. Oh. Um so S- Spain actually had huge portions of what is modern day southern United States. Do you think they're mad that they don't own it anymore? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um So one of the interesting things, and this is a a theme in Native American history, is that um, the Cherokee Native Americans, who are based mostly in, like, Georgia, um, they uh, aid the United States Army in a lot of these battles. And sort of these betrayals by, you know, tribes that have historically been at war with each other, been very different from one another, Um, you know... these poor Cherokee, because they think that they're, like, doing the right thing by siding with the United States, and that's going to get them prestige and recognition. And, and land and, and safety. Land and safety, <laughs> and, of course, that doesn't happen. So um, the Cherokee, and I, I teach, when I teach about the Cherokee in my history classes, they're a really interesting Native community because they, um, like I said, try to... M- westernize okay and um they adopt christianity um they adopt western you know english customs um they uh have they are they're so they're christian they have a newspaper um Mm. like there's a lot of things that are so so they live in houses like for gosh sakes (laughs) like you know there's so there's so many things and um the cherokee land becomes desirable for people to expand slavery into. Okay. And basically the Cherokee gotta go if you're Andrew Jackson. And so despite the fact that they have aided him in attacking the Seminole yeah, and the Muskegee, and like, given their lives and, and liberties to help him. Yep. I mean, seriously? Yeah. So, um, so Jackson moves to expel the, so, so when Jackson becomes president, he moves to expel the Cherokee from their land. The Cherokee, remember, are as integrated in this culture and have done everything that they've been asked to do by the English settlers and now the United States of Americans. And so um, they know their rights, they know the law, so they sue and they go all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court sides with Cherokee Nation. Whoa. And Jackson doesn't care. And he expels them anyway. Whoa. And so... The Cherokee, along with all sorts of tribes in the southeastern United States, are moved, forcibly removed from their homes um, and taken to, like, modern-day Oklahoma. Ugh. But they don't have trains. They don't have enough wagons for everybody. This is a huge operation to move thousands of people. To displace people. To displace people. To move them from their homes, expel them from their land, and take them to Oklahoma. They're essentially refugees at that point. Yeah. Yes. 
I mean, but, but like under gunpoint as they're being escorted by the U.S. military elsewhere. This is also like, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to be like, hey, grandma, you ready to walk to Oklahoma tomorrow? Not only that, but like, why do I have to go to Oklahoma? Can I pick somewhere else? So they pick Oklahoma because it's barren. It's, I played a lacrosse game at Oklahoma State when I was in school. (laughs) And the big sky. (laughs) Oklahoma State, like you think huge state university. It was like a dirt field. Oh, yeah. It's like, oh my gosh. Um, We'll get, there's the Osage County. Okay. um, They discover oil there in the 1920s. Oh. In Oklahoma. And all these Native Americans own all the land. Sweet. And it's like great redemption story. Um, although there's a whole bunch of murders of Native Americans to get access to their land rights, we should definitely do something on this history yeah. at some point. But we're digressing a little bit. Oh my gosh. But Anyways. I loved that it was sort of like, oh, and I'm sitting on oil in the Oh, you moved, me, you moved me out here where there's no trees. And, uh, yep, we've oh, got crap. oil. Crap ton of oil. Um, so anyway... Um, kind of love that. Uh, yeah. So the Native Americans are forcibly marched out. And I um, found a bunch of oral histories that um, were recorded in, like, the 1930s. Okay. Um, of Native American people telling stories that were passed down to them by their parents and grandparents about the Trail of Tears. Okay. Which is what this event has been, been named. Been come, yeah, been named. So um, I've asked Brooke to yeah. help me by reading <clears throat> a few of these. So I'll start by sharing one of them. This is from a woman named Mary Payne. Okay, She was interviewed in 1937. And she said, My father was David Israel, a full-blood Cherokee, and my mother was Martha Jane Miller Israel, a quarter Cherokee. One thing that strikes me about all of these is they are, like, very specific about how much Cherokee or or whatever tribe they're from. It shouldn't be weird, though, and this is why, is that most people today who do have Native American blood know exactly the percentage of how much they have and from what tribe because there's so many things that go along with that in your lifetime of grants and money and funding and education and things that you have access to, mm-hmm. as well as what those tribes offer if you are a part of them. Yeah. Um, so it's not odd that they would know that. But it's almost like your humanness and your, like, you're, like, measuring that out. I guess so. But, like, I don't know. Think about Elizabeth Warren. Oh, I know. <laughs> like, there's people that try and claim, and you should know how much you belong to a society. It's the same thing if, like, when you do your genetic history. I don't know. I have none, obviously, but, like, the... Um, I know what part of Germany my family is from in the mm-hmm. 1700s. I know what part of England they're from in the 1600s. Like, yeah, I don't. Yeah, we can go pretty far with That's my cool. family, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, but tribes are a little bit different. Yeah, communities. Yeah. Communities. It's it's belonging to a community. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So she says they were born in Georgia. They were brought to Indian territory by their parents <laughs> over the Trail of Tears. When the Indians were driven from their eastern homes by the United States troops, they were too young to know of the tragedies and sorrows of that terrible event. My aunt, who was 15 years old at the time, told me of the awful suffering along the journey. Almost everyone had to walk as the conveyance they had were inadequate for transporting the few, uh, what few possessions they had and their meager supply of food. Only the old people and little children were allowed to ride. They died by the hundreds and were buried by the roadside. As they were not allowed to remove any of the household goods, they arrived at their destination with nothing with which to start housekeeping. Wow. <clears throat> That's insane. They just left their thriving communities that they had, that they were stable in. Yeah, that they'd been in for, for centuries. centuries. <clears throat> That's crazy. Did you want me to read this one? Yeah, from Josephine Pennington. Okay, so this is from Josephine Pennington. Um, October 12, 1937. So, after the Ridges made this treaty and those who favored it moved west, Chief Ross and his band of 12,000 still refused to move, and they met abuse and troubles indescribable and finally the united states soldiers were sent to move chief ross and his people 
After the soldiers appeared, they began to build stockades to house the Cherokees until they could get them moving. To, they put stockades. Like, that's what you do for animals. They put these people into stockades. Oh, man. Okay, all over the Cherokee county country, they went bringing in all of them, young and old, male and female, and their babies and the sick, the lame, and the halt. They hunted them down like hunting wild beasts, and when they found them, they drove the threats and blows like cattle to these stockades. These stockades were overcrowded. Disease broke out among them, and many of them died with dysentery. Dysentery is like uh, like diarrhea, like extreme yeah. diarrhea from uh, just like bad drinking water. I remember it from Oregon Trail. It's oh. usually how your character died. Oh. <laughs> Is That's that horrible. or you ran out of cattle. Oh Sorry. Gosh. Okay, so poor food and poor water, no doctors, no medicine. In due time, parties were started west under the charge of soldiers. These parties were driven through like cattle. The sick and the weak walked until they fell exhausted and then were loaded in wagons and left behind to die. When streams were to be crossed, if not too deep, all were compelled to wade. The water oftentimes was in to the chins of the men and women, and the little children were carried high above their heads. If the water was over their heads, they would build rafts and cross on them. Wow. Chief Ross and the council begged the government to let them take over the moving after a few parties had been moved by the soldiers, and this was agreed upon. They began to establish camps, and their health got better. It was only a short time until Chief Ross had worked out the details for the removal, and with these arrangements, many died on account of cold and hunger and root and were buried in unmarked graves. One of those who's di- who died on the Trail of Tears was Jim Ross Jr., the son of Jim Ross. Um, I've seen I, 4,000 Native Americans died um, just 4, walking. 4,000? Yeah. And granted, that's, <clears throat> you know, a percentage, and there were many that survived, um, but they survived and got to where they're being sent, you know, with nothing. Even with them overseeing their own travels, it, that, People was, were dying. that was a difficult journey no matter yep. the undertaking. Yeah. Oy, that's brutal. It's pretty brutal. Um, and what, what was the purpose of moving all of these people? That they just didn't want them in, in Georgia anymore? Yeah, I mean, there was a big debate in this time period about... Um, what they called civilization or removal. And the civilization folks were trying to say, like, let's civilize these Native Americans. Let's bring them to Dartmouth College and we'll teach them all yeah. their customs. And let's, you know, we'll we'll take their children and we'll bring them to our special boarding schools. There's a boarding school in Pennsylvania called the Carlisle School where yep. they, like, took over, like, took all these kids and brought them in and, and raised them Christian and cut their hair and made them look like the English dress. And, you know, these poor kids are, like, half in one culture, half in another culture. Their their skin's too dark to fit into racist U.S. Yeah. But they go home, and they don't know any of their indigenous customs, and that's really complicated. Um, And so, but the idea of that was maybe if we can just get them to integrate better, we won't have to kill them. And it's like, what? Well, so it's interesting. There is there is this um, this book that I read in college in one of my English lit-, lit classes. And it's about this tribe in Oregon. And they take 15 of their, their young women. Mm-hmm. And they trade them with 15 of the young women from the English mm-hmm. to try and marry the two communities. Yeah. Because if they, if they trade them... And then those women get married to men in those yep. communities and they have babies. Integrate. Then they're all integrated, and and the races are no longer separate. Yeah, they all fight as one. Right. And so it was like a method. All but all these girls are kidnapped from their homes. Parents didn't make the choice to send their daughter. So it's this huge like sex trafficking, if you will. Yeah. There's another one um, here from this oral history, a woman named Mary Hill. She says, this is what her grandmother told her. She said, 
the grandmother said, in every way we were abundantly blessed in our everyday life in the old country. We had our hunting grounds and all the things that are dear to the heart or interest of the Indian. But many different rumors of a removal to the far west was often heard. The command for removal came unexpectedly upon most of us. There was a time that we noticed that several overloaded wagons were passing our home, yet we did not grasp the meeting. However, it was not long until we found out the reason. Wagons stopped at our home, and the men in charge commanded us to gather what few belongings could be crowded into the wagons. We were to be taken away and leave our homes never to return. This was just the beginning of much weeping and heartaches. We were taken to a crudely built stockade and joined others of our tribe. We were kept penned up until everything was ready before we started the march. Even here, there was awful silence that showed the heartaches and sorrow at being taken from our homes and even separation from loved ones. Most of us had not foreseen such a move in this fashion or at this time. We were not prepared, but the times came more horrible after the real journey was begun. Many fell by the wayside, too faint with hunger or too weak to keep up with the rest. The aged, feeble, and sick were left to perish by the wayside. A crude bed was quickly prepared for these, these sick and weary people. Only a bowl of water was left within reach, and thus they were left to suffer and die alone. The little children uh, piteously cried day after day from weariness, hunger, and illness. Many of the men, women, and, and even the children were forced to walk. They were once happy children, left without mother and father, crying, could not, uh, crying could not bring consolidation to these children. The sick and the births required attention. And remember, birth. Right? Oh we my gosh, before, yeah. Like, you still have to give birth. Like, Imagine doing this journey pregnant. Oh my god. I can't. Ugh. But, I mean, this sounds so much like when the Nazis came for... So, like, first they came for the Jews. Then they came... You know, it's like they came for everyone... And no one spoke up. It's like they just saw these these trailers coming and people going. Yeah. And they just thought, well, maybe it won't be me. It's like, well, no, then it was you. Yeah. This other woman, uh, Rhonda James, she said that her mom, a Cherokee, told her that um, when the white people came into the communities that they were leaving behind, the white people would basically just say, quote, this is mine and I'm going to have it. And Whoa. they would, like, walk into people's houses and be like, all right, this will do. And, like, you don't even think about that part of it, which is that, like, these homes are being left intact for other people to just move, move into. into. Oh, and my that's gosh. what the Nazis did in Poland but the, and other oh, places. Oh, yeah. And, but think about, like, how elitist you have to feel and how empowered you have to feel to feel comfortable to do that. Yeah. Like, no, no, I'm white. I'm untouchable. Ugh, that's gross. Yeah. Um... This one woman, I just want to tell this story because it's personal. Josephine Latimer tells the story of her um, of her family who who encountered the Trail of Tears. Um, it got really cold on their journey, and cholera was spread um, among the people that were you know marching with them. And um, so her grandfather got sick. And they, the grandmother is like, okay, well, we'll, we'll all, you know, they're going to kick him out of the wagon because he's sick and they don't want everybody to get cholera. So they kick him out and the grandmother's like, no, 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 like we'll go with him. And, um, and so the, the people are like, okay, well then we'll put the, the children out with you too. And the driver replied, all right, but we'll soon be dead and you and your three children will have to walk the balance of the way. Each child had a small blanket. My grandmother had a paisley shawl that she had brought along, a bucket of honey, and some cold flour from their home. This flour made by parching corn and grinding it in a coffee mill until pulverized. This food she carried along for her six-month-old baby. She begged the driver for food and blanket for the great-grandfather, and he grudgingly gave the blanket and one day's supply of food. One day. Oh, my gosh. Great-grandfather was conscious at times. He had dubbed great-grandmother Little Blue Hen, and when he became conscious of their plight, he would say, Dear Little Blue Hen, why didn't you take the children and go on? I can't last much longer, and my soul would rest much easier if I knew you were safe. My body is just dust, and it will be all right at any place. 
She replied, as long as you live, I will be with you, dear. Then Little Blue Hen and two boys, aged 10 and 12, set about fixing a bed. And I think that, like, sometimes when we talk about numbers and statistics, we just lose sort of, like, these are people with loved ones and, like, yeah. little children. She's got a six-month-old baby. She's about to lose her spouse. Like, this is this is the impact of policies that, you know, Jackson is... is I don't know. It's just... We keep doing this. Yeah. Like, this happened to these people. This is why you teach history class. You know, you try and show where people misstepped or, or how do we not repeat that error. We have stockades in Texas going on right now with immigrants in it. Yeah. And their children have been separated from them and lost. Yeah. Like, we're still doing it. Yeah. Well, and I think the bigger issue is that there are too many people that are reluctant to use the G word, genocide. It is genocide. It you are forcibly removing people. That is what that's that is that is that. That's what it is. Like and 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 I think you've got to tell that history and when you read it from people's lived experiences that makes it all the more real than to say and Jackson made the people march, you know, several thousand miles to Oklahoma. Like, yeah, no, that doesn't that doesn't do justice to, you know, this person's grandparents holding each other as he dies. But it also on doesn't. The side of the yeah, road. exactly. And it's not building quality community members. Like that's what you're trying to get across to a student in your classroom is like, understand where your privilege lies check it, and then also be aware that someone else's history is not the same as yours. Yeah. And this happened to this culture. In this country, in, with in, that flag flying. Yeah. Like, I think the, the... I think you've said this in the past, like, building little patriots is not your job. It's 100% accurate. Like, no, that's not our job. That's not why you're a history teacher. But making students aware, having levels of empathy knowing how to challenge, you know, different things that are going on in the world and know when to say this is wrong and stand up for that. Yeah, yeah. Like, where were all the people saying, like, we probably shouldn't move these people? Yeah. Like, were there protesters at the time? Were there yes. people so that, that's like, the other thing that's came crazy back? To me is I, I love when people make comments like, well, in, at that time, you know, that's just how they dealt with the Native Americans and that's what everybody thought. And it's like, oh, geez. No, that's not what everybody thought. There are protesters <clears throat> all across the country, like, okay. Hel- like Helen um, Jackson. Like, you know, like there are people that are speaking up about what is going on Good. and saying, like, this is not okay. And are they staking their life on that? Maybe I mean, not, the, but the like, government even said that, like, they've cited it for the Cherokees. They said, yeah, yeah, you're right. You don't have to move. Yeah. Jackson is known as anti-Indian, and, you know, in 1930, or sorry, 1832, he's reelected. And a lot of people read that as, like, a reaffirming of, yep, we support these policies. Well, so you could absolutely see that. And then you could also see being a Native American, like, this, so we're stuck another four years. Yeah. How disheartening. Yeah, yeah. So one thing that was in the um, Indigenous Peoples book that I read uh, that she talks about is surviving genocide is resilience. And, okay. And I really loved that idea. It, it's, it is a form of resistance. Yeah. And so even if you aren't fighting back, like, you don't have to tell a story about Native Americans in battle. You just need to tell the story of the grandmother who held her, well, she wasn't a grandmother at the time, but the, you know, this yeah. woman who held her six-month-old baby, her two boys that are under the age of 12, and walked to Oklahoma and survived. Right. And, like, that is resistance. They lived. You they will lived. not take me down. Yeah. And, you know, when people got there, they started um, digging in, like, there were these caves in some areas, like, into mountainsides, and they turned those into homes as a temporary means. And then they built cabins and, you know, and built permanent They lived. They settlements lived. And lived. Yeah. And... I love that. And I, I heard recently, like, if you're going to talk about Native Americans, you need to talk about them in the present tense because they are 
here. Oh, sure. And um, and I think that's something that t- teachers need to be really. I was just of. looking up. I was like, I'm so curious. Like, what are the largest tribes now? And yeah, um, there's a huge list, which is very cool that I found. But um, I kind of loved that there's so many. There's over sixty, you know, that have still over ten thousand. Native Americans within their group. Yeah. So it's not like... I, I do think when we were growing up, it was a past tense conversation. You didn't know yeah. that they're... Wounded knee and they're gone. And yeah, they're gone. and like yeah. that there are still active culture. Yeah. So I have a lesson plan for teachers to use. It centralizes... It's central on Andrew Jackson um, as a president. It includes the Peggy Eaton story. It includes uh, the Trail okay. of Tears. Um, it also talks about the um, National Bank veto, the nullification crisis, the spoil system. These are all things that I haven't mentioned at all, but um, were big things that were going on in that time period that um, he would have dealt with as president and also help determine whether or not he was a president for the common man. Okay. Um, it, throughout the lesson plan, what I've tried to do is build in primary sources of women. And my idea here is just that, like, you're going to teach Andrew Jackson in school, so let's bring voices of women into this conversation right. that could be very heavily male-dominated. Right. Um, and and let's let, let's let women have a place in that conversation. Let's let their stories come through, um, their primary accounts come through, and... And, you know, and, and, and let that happen. I love the, um, some of these things that we're reading of the, the, what oral are these? Histories. Oral histories. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oral history is such a great way to, to study history. to, to Well, and to it just sources. gives you what you were saying. It gives you a person to rest your eyes on to say that they were real and it's not 4,000 people. It's yeah this woman. It's really cool. It's really cool. Thanks, Kelsey. Thank you. I'm Brooke Sullivan. I'm Kelsey Eckert. See you next time. Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.